So, Martha, uh, the screen and floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. And also, thanks, uh, Eremit, for inviting me. It's always good to be here. And thank you all for showing up in person or online. I will talk about a few works that uh, I've been doing in the past couple of years uh, with collaborators from many places. Actually, the, the, this first paper is with collaboration with people from at the time Geneva. Well, since then, I mean, I moved to Vienna and I moved to Sweden. Uh, Jean Daniel is in Paris now. And uh, and Jan Kanievsky, well, he was already in Warsaw and he's still in Warsaw. The second paper is, is mostly an ICFO, but it's fully an ICFO uh, collaboration. And then the last one is again with Jan Kanievsky and Ashwin Nayak from, from Canada. But all of these three papers kind of consider the same, the same concept that we call mutually unbiased measurements. So I will. I will try to introduce this concept to you, maybe try to convince you that they, they are interesting and everyone should be should be working on this because I, I've done it already. Uh, and to start, I will kind of try to, to give a, a generic overview of, of what I mean by measurements in quantum theory, because well, I work in quantum theory and I'm, I'm quite interested in measurements in quantum theory, but I guess here we have people from many backgrounds, so maybe I would just attempt to, to end up on the same page. Okay, so measurements. Measurements in quantum information theory. So in this first slide, I will just give you a few things that if you if you open up like a quantum mechanics textbook, you will see similar things. So for every quantum system, a physical system, we always associate a, a Hilbert space, and I will be only interested in, in systems with a finite degree of, of freedom. So this D, the Hilbert space is always a, some complex Hilbert space of dimension D, where this D is the number of degrees of freedom. So I will not be talking about like position and momentum and, and these kind of continuous variable systems, but you can think of like a, like a spin system, like a spin one half particle, then my Hilbert space. I would rather say that finite number of states than dimensionality. Yeah. Dimensionality somehow we associate with something different, with X, Y, Z and so well, you have a finite number of states that you can distinguish perfectly. Yes. Um, but yes, when you kind of when you want to describe it in a, in a mathematical way, people talk about the dimension of the of the vector space. This is what I mean. But yes, if you think of a, a spin one half particle, you have two states that you can perfectly distinguish. If you think of I'm measuring the spin in the z direction, I can distinguish the the spin up state from the spin down state perfectly. But I can write down any state. Which is a which is a superposition of a spin up and a spin down state with some some complex amplitudes that give me like a, a normalized vector eventually. So these are the kind of systems that I'm interested in, but I will mostly talk about measurements. So then again, if you go to a textbook and look at okay, what is a what is a measurement? What you will see is that it's a it's a Hermitian operator on the same Hilbert space. It's important that it's Hermitian because then I have uh, I have this uh, eigen decomposition of the of the operator, so I have these uh, projections onto some orthonormal basis, this phi x, and importantly the eigenvalues of the operator are real, and these are the these are the outcomes of the measurement. I'm measuring some sort of physical uh, quantity, and I get a real number as an outcome, which is what I would expect from any sort of physical experiment. So. So the measurements are defined, uh, described by these kind of permission operators, and it gives me the probabilities for a given state. So if my state is psi, if my measurement is described by this operator, then the probability that I will observe the outcome A of X is given by this, uh, this modulus overlap square of the, of the vectors, the corresponding vector of the measurement and the vector that describes my quantum system. And I will write it in this form. It's the, the trace of the product of the two projections, because this will be kind of more convenient for me later. So, <clears throat> the, uh, well, maybe not exactly this, but something similar is what you will see in, in like quantum uh, mechanics textbooks. What we are, uh, sorry, yeah, again, like you can have a, an example, which is what I told you already, like if you want to measure the spin, 
then if you want to measure it in the z direction, then this is described by the by the the spin operator, which is just the the Pauli z operator uh, multiplied by this h bar over two constant. So the first outcome tells me that the spin in the z direction is positive h bar over two. The second outcome will give me that it's negative h bar over two. These are the kind of possible outcomes of this spin measurement. So this is how I describe a measurement. Uh, but in quantum information theory, what we are mostly interested in, we don't really care about like what is the what is the value of these uh, uh, of these physical quantities. We want to what we're interested in is to encode some information in quantum systems and then and then decode this information through the measurement. So the measurement outcome will tell me like, well, which uh, I'm only interested in kind of which outcome I obtained. Because if I want to encode information, then it's kind of more a, it's more of an abstract thing. Maybe I can encode the same information, like a bit zero or one. I can encode it in a, like a spin up state or spin down state. But equivalently, I might choose like a different platform. I want to encode this information in, a, in the polarization of a photon, for example. Do I have a horizontal or vertical polarization? And in quantum information theory, we often don't really care about the platform itself. We just care about, well, I encoded a bit and I want to decode it in some way. So the, the actual values are not really important. I will just kind of ascribe zeros and ones, or if I have more outcomes, I ascribe some kind of numbers to these outcomes, but I forget about the actual value and I only care about what is the probability with which I obtain this outcome. And then if you look at this measure, this Hermitian operator, I don't really care about the, the value here. So I describe a measurement by just a collection of these projections onto some orthonormal basis. And still I can recover the probabilities on any state. On any state psi, I can still say the, out, the probability of observing outcome X, which is now just kind of a label, not necessarily a physical quantity. The probability of this outcome is again given by the, by the, same, the same formula that I mm. had before. So because of this, I will, I will describe measurements. Well, at this stage, I'm saying I'm describing measurements with the projections onto some orthonormal basis. But I can, if I'm only interested in probabilities, I can, I can describe it in, in an even more general way. So the, so the next slide, I will just tell you like the, the generic ways in which we describe states and measurements that is relevant for, for, probab for obtaining probabilities. So, okay, I had this formula on the previous slide. The red one is the state and the blue one is the, the measurement operator for this outcome X. Now I can always take some probabilistic mixture of, of some quantum states. So instead of just one state, I have some PJ probability distribution and I take different psi J states with, with different probabilities. You can imagine that like I flip a coin and I prepare this state or that state. And this is still a, a a valid physical procedure, this is still a valid physical state. So if I have these kind of probability mixtures of these systems, this is still a valid system. So in general, I can describe states of this form, which is equivalent of saying that I have some positive semi-definite operator, this rho, which uh, has trace one. So for me, this is a state, and this will be useful for me to define probabilities, which is mostly what I'm interested in. And similarly for measurements, uh, they will be described by positive operator value measures, POVMs. In this discrete case, this is described by a set of positive semi-definite operators. So in the, in the, on the earlier slide, this is kind of the blue, these projections. Now they don't have to be projections. They have to be, still have to be positive semi-definite operators and they add up to the identity operator. If I plug in anything like this in kind of the same formula, but now I replace this, uh, this projection with any density operator and I replace my other projection, the measurement projection with, the, with this element of this POVM, then I still get a valid probability distribution. Everything is fine. I can, I can always, if I only care about probabilities, this is kind of the, the generic framework I will use to, to describe this. My system is in state row. My measurement is described by, by these operators. And then, well, if you feel kind of uncomfortable with this uh, POVM, because here I didn't really give a physical procedure of like, what is this? 
whereas with the states, you can think of it as this probabilistic mixture. There's this Neimark dilation procedure, which tells you that every such POVM can be implemented if I use an ancillary system, enlarging the system. And on the larger system, I have a, a projected measurement for which we have a, mm -hmm. maybe a, a, a more physical idea of what these are. So, <clears throat> so I can implement it in the, in the standard way. Right, so these are kind of the, mostly these, these measurements are the objects I'm, I'm interested in. And uh, I will describe to you first uh, a class of measurements that are called mutually unbiased spaces. Well, first, because you saw that uh, these project, some of these uh, rank on projected measurements, they are, the state, they are projections onto some orthonormal basis. So if I give you a basis, I give you a measurement as well. So some measurements, these are pairs of measurements that satisfy certain properties, which I tell you just in a second. They are called mutually unbiased bases, but they are bases, but you can also think of them as measurements. So if I give you two bases on a, on a D-dimensional complex Hilbert space, such that if I take a vector from one of the bases and I take a vector from, one, from the other bases, I take this uh, inner product square, they are, they are uniform. So they are kind of nice and symmetric bases. These, if I give you two bases that satisfy this, I call these MUVs. Um, and an example again is the, the IDM basis of the, of the Pauli Z and X operators, which is if you still like thinking this kind of spin picture, if, if I take these two eigenstates of the, of the Pauli Z operator, which you can think of as like a spin up and spin down state, then okay, this is one of the IDM bases. In this basis, the, eigen, uh, the eigenbasis of the X operator looks like just this kind of a equal superposition with plus or minus sign of the spin up and spin down states. So these are two bases that it's kind of easy to verify that they satisfy this, uh, this constraint. And then the corresponding measurements are the, the spin measurements in the, in the Z and X directions. So these two measurements, uh, spin Z and X, they define a pair of measurements that uh, that I will call MUVs. Um, right, exactly. So when you have, whenever you have an orthonormal basis, then the corresponding these projections define the measurement that give you the, the MUV measurements. Um, and if you're, I'm not sure if there are people here that are less interested in physics and more interested in maths, but if there are, then a, a kind of purely mathematical question related to these objects is the the maximum number of these bases that are pairwise mutually unbiased in a, in a given dimension. This is not fully resolved. Uh, it's been an open problem for like 30 years now. So we know that in every dimension and for every D, I have at most D plus one bases that can satisfy this relation. This is kind of a geometric argument. And if this dimension is prime or a power of a prime, we know that you can always find these but if the dimension is not a power of prime, so six is the, the lowest one, then we actually don't know. We know that there exists at least three, at most seven, but nothing in between. So this is a this is somehow not uh, not solved yet. Even though many people are interested in in these MUVs, I guess on the on the mathematics side, it's because they are related to Hadamard matrices and they are kind of nice symmetric discrete structures on Hilbert spaces. On the, on the physics or quantum info side, it's because MUV measurements, they have a lot of use in, in quantum information tasks. So I will just give you two examples. Uh, the first one is the actually the original paper where the concept of MUVs appeared, and this is quantum state determination. So if you know that uh, I have a, a state in a, I have a D-dimensional state, but I don't know the state itself, I just know that it's D-dimensional, uh, and I want to re reconstruct the state, but I have to make some measurements and I can try to reconstruct the full density operator. If I want to do this with, uh, with projective measurements and I want the minimal statistical error in my reconstruction, then actually the best thing I can do is measure a full set of these D plus one MUVs. Well, if they exist, right? So then uh, in this sense, this is why 
it might be relevant from even the, the kind of quantum info point of view whether whether the maximal set exists in every dimension because well if you say well i have a six dimensional state i want to reconstruct it by some measurements um but if there are no seven muvs then i need to do kind of something else i cannot reach this this optimal state determination protocol could you tell us in in the simplest possible way why such mutually uh, unbiased basis out of relevance so of relevance to quantum information or of relevance to you to me <laughs> i mean i'm personally kind of interested interested in math so i always like kind of symmetric structures but i think the the and the physically math, are they important i would say so they have they have a important properties they have a intuitive kind of quantum properties that I will also show you on the next slide okay. but uh, okay yeah maybe I just show you on the next slide and then you can you can ask again if you okay if you if you still have doubt so this is the yeah this was the first time they appeared and then uh, uh maybe sorry about that. yes to interrupt so you said that they are optimal for such skull say for uh state tomography essentially yes to do well so but they are not, all, as far as I understand, they are not the only measurement that, like any two design, I think, would, would work, right? Yes. Correct. And there are plenty, you can construct them without the problem in any dimension. Yes, the thing, uh, so I think if you, if you want to minimize your statistical error and you only, and you only want to measure rank on projective measurements, then this is the choice. If you, okay, if you have access to like, uh, Seek POVM or information complete POVM. I don't know how the statistical error relates to the MUV protocol, but surely you can you can always reconstruct. The question is also like if you sample over random states that you don't know and you want to recon because you always have like a finite sample, right? You you get your measurement outcomes, you record them, you have some error in this. If you want mm -hmm. to minimize this error with which you reconstruct the state, then MUVs are optimal. Sure, just. Sure, but there are other there are other ways. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So this is a uh, this is about state determination, and another one which maybe a bit more quantum information e is uh, quantum cryptography. So this uh, this so called BB eighty four protocol it it uses MUVs in dimension two. Like I mm -hmm. give you like a short description of this protocol. So. Uh, yeah, so the the sender of the message, may, imagine that you want to send a bit of information to someone, you encode this bit in a quantum state, but you can choose in which basis you encode this bit. So let's say you want to send the bit zero, then either you, set, you send the state zero, well now instead of spin up and down, I wrote zero and one, but it's the same kind of concept. Either you send the state zero for this, or you encode it in the other basis, which is, so these two bases are MUVs, and I send this state instead. If I want to send the bit one, I either send the state one or this uh, other element of the of the basis, which is unbiased to the first one. Okay, I send it to my to the receiver. The receiver measures in one of these two bases, the same basis, makes a measurement in either this basis or that basis. Now. You see, if the basis agree, so if, if I measured in the same basis in which the encoding was made, I recover the information perfectly. Well, if the, ba if the basis didn't agree, then I actually measure noise. I don't get any information. But uh, so what happens after, after this uh, sending the information is that the sender will announce which basis they used to encode the message. And then the receiver will also say, okay, I measured in these spaces, and they only keep the ones where the bases agreed. Um, and in this case, in the ideal case, all of the all of the out uh, like the the decoding should always be perfect. So they can kind of check this on a small sample. They say, well, now I also reveal like some subset of my uh, the sender say, okay, some small subset. I reveal of uh, what I actually wanted to send you publicly, and they can they can see whether they match or not. If they don't match, this means that perhaps 
there was an eavesdropper in the channel somewhere, they intercept the state, they do something with the state, and in this case, cloning, which, okay, I get the quantum information people know, maybe not everyone knows, but basically quantum theory tells you that uh, if you're in the middle and you're trying to intercept a quantum state and resend something else, this, this can be detected. You cannot like just, just copy the quantum state and send it over. So with this protocol, if there's an eavesdropper, you can detect it. And so okay, there are like some, some uh, even in the non-ideal case, there are some security proofs that tells you, well, even if, if, the, if the errors are only due to some kind of natural noise, you can still be sure that your, your communication was secure. And so you see that this cryptographic protocol also uses, uh, uses MUVs. And there are definitely, uh, many other protocols in quantum info that, that use these bases, not just in dimension two, but uh, okay, my examples are mostly by dimension two. And so, yes, yeah, so what is, the, what is the property that makes MUVs so useful in these, in these information tasks. <clears throat> so you can actually think of an alternative definition of, of MUVs. You take two uh, projective measurements on a, on a D-dimensional Hilbert space, P and Q, and the MUV property tells you that if I have a state such that uh, I measure P on this state and I always get the outcome A. So this is the probability of obtaining outcome A. If I always get this outcome, the probability is one, then if on the same state I measure the other measurement, Q, then the probability of each outcome B is the same, uniform, one over D. So the kind of information that uh, one of the measurements reveals is complementary to the other one. If I, if I always get the same outcome on one measurement, then I get a completely uniform outcome on the other measurement. This is kind of what makes it useful in this, uh, in this cryptographic scenario. And this is also why it's useful in, in state determinant state tomography, because the information I got out from, from one of the measurements is, is uh, kind of independent of the information that I get from the other measurements. Um, yes, yeah, so you can think of, you think, can you think of MUVs in this uh, complementarity uh, point of view. So yeah, this is why I think they are relevant. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think, yes, that's, uh, that's all about MUVs. And now I introduce mutually unbiased measurement, which is a generalization of the, of the MUV concept. Mm -hmm. um, so I will start again from this complementarity point of view, because this is like a the nicest way to explain it, I think. Um, so I have the, if you look back on the previous slide, I have the exact same definition. I just, instead of saying that my measurement acts on a D-dimensional Hilbert space, I just say it's any Hilbert space. I, bas I just don't know the dimension of the Hilbert space. But the, but the defining property is the same. If I have a state that gives me the same outcome with probability one uh, for one of the measurements, then the other measurement on the same state should give me a completely uniform outcome. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is my definition. Well, this is, okay, so this definition was, uh, was first introduced in, in this paper, um, where they, they used exactly this definition and they were, they were also mostly looking at the continuous <laughs> variables, but pretty much this complementarity property. And uh, in our paper here, this is the formulation that they first found to be useful in some task I will tell you about later. This is more like, a, like an algebraic relation between the, these measurement operators of the, of the P of M. So we found this, then we learned about this paper and actually we could show that these two definitions are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So the intuitive definition mm -hmm. is, is this, it's really about this complementarity. And I think it, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense why you could be interested in, in such measurements. But you also have a nice uh, algebraic characterization. And actually, this characterization is also, this is something that, uh, well, uh, a slightly different version appeared in, in this paper. Uh, so the ingredients were sort of already there, but we found, we found this nice connection and we also found some, some nice use for these, for these measurements. 
So the way you can think about this characterization instead of the instead of the MUV definition where you have to assume the Hilbert space dimension, now you don't, which is which is often kind of the case because if you're given some quantum system, you don't really know anything about it. There is no physical reason why you would say that okay, I know what is the maximal number of degrees of freedom of this system. This is not a this is not an observable property. This is not something you can really verify and put like an upper bound on. You never really know whether there is something that you are missing. So we remove this from the definition and we just say there is some there is some quantum system. I don't know the number of degrees of freedom. The only thing that matters is D. This is now just the number of outcomes of my measurement, which is something that you like directly observe. When you make a measurement, you see this, 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 or this outcome. So this is more of a an operational thing. We're still assuming it's finite dimensions. Um, you so don't have to know. So if, if you measure and repeat, then you don't count, right? Sorry? No, you, you say that you need to count how many different outcomes you have. So if you repeat the same, then you don't count. It's like uh, one more next. What is D? So D, this is the the number of possible different outcomes my measurement yes, can give. Yes. Only the number of different. So if you repeat previous one, you don't count. What do you mean by repeating the difference. previous one? No, you, you, you repeat measurement by measurement by measurement. You don't know how many measurements. So you need to, to count only different. So you have, you have like a given measurement device that is described by these operators, right? Now this, I can feed in a quantum state to this device, it gives me an outcome, right? If you think of a spin measurement, I can, I can give it a state, it gives me spin up or spin down, mm -hmm. right? And this is what I did. In this case, D is two, because the device will always tell me either up or down. So is the question about degeneracy? No, the question, uh, how do you know that you, you already found all different states? You have to continue, continue. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, yeah, this is also true, but uh, yes, okay. I think this is still this is still kind of easier to accept. <laughs> you you can never be sure, but if you say okay, all of the all of the quantum states I measured, I got either this outcome or this outcome. Uh, if there's a possible third outcome, maybe, mm -hmm. but. Uh, but controlling the degrees of freedom of your system, I think this is a harder task, right? You can, mm -hmm. and especially in these sort of cryptographic scenarios, this becomes very important because you're sending a system. Now, if I assume that my system is, is either zero or one, and this is an assumption, then I can be I can be kind of safe. But if it's actually a much larger system, the the extra degrees of freedom might be used to, to send some side information that can be intercepted by some eavesdropper, for example, and the extra degrees of freedom can be can be dangerous in a way for, for these information processing tasks. Whereas measurement outcomes are always something that you, you sort of observe directly. In the infinite dimensional case, can one think about position and momentum operators as those two measurements which are mutually uh, unbiased because we have the properties. I know what is the precise state of the momentum. I have no knowledge about the state of the position, mm -hmm. which means that probably my position from this perspective is just a uniform distribution. So can one also say that on this highly dimensional case, those operators to be mutually unbiased should be connected by some kind of discrete Fourier transform? So, Okay, the, the connection between the, the discrete, because here you see that there is this discreteness still, even if the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, I have a discrete number of outcomes. So if you think of your, your position and momentum operators, I guess usually you think of it as having a continuous spectrum, yeah. but at least one of them. And uh, so then you don't really end up with exactly this formulation. The, the, what they actually do in this first paper is look at uh, it continues measurement is D, and I treat it as a really dimensional my state, mm -hmm. not the number of different measurement outcomes. Then this analogy, should, what I said, should be true or not? 
Intuitively, kind of, yes, but if you try to work out the details, it's not, it's not exactly clear how this goes. Okay, if you take the, so indeed you can create a so finite. Look at this, it looks for me as an analog of uncertainty. Yes, it is. So, okay, what, what you can do precisely is you take in the, in the finite dimensional case, you can indeed take like computational basis and the Fourier transform. Yes. And then in, I believe in the weak topology, this will in the limit, if you go with the dimension to the limit of infinity, this will give you number and phase operators. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the most strict like analogy between the discrete and the mm -hmm. continuous case that is known. And then, yeah, you could also try to kind of uh, generalize this definition. Mm -hmm. Then you need to be careful about what you mean by a uniform uh, distribution once you have a continuum. This is not super clear to me how to do this properly. And also, so in every, in every prime dimension, you have D plus one measurement that pairwise MUDs. So then, <laughs> What do you expect in infinite dimension? In infinite dimensions, with this construction, if you take the limit, you only find two. Um, so this again, like tells you that, okay, this limit, okay, in some cases you can make sense of it, but it's not exactly clear what is the precise relation. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't necessarily get infinitely many continuous measurements than you be in this sense. So yes, there is it's, there is a clear analogy, but if you want to make it precise, you you run into some problem. Okay. Um, and if you discretize both space of X's and P's, yes, if you discretize kind of the, the outcome, they are still infinitely many, but now they are countable. Um, yes, okay, so this I don't know. Okay, okay, so you can think of this definition as kind of a we call this device independent characterization. Device independence here simply means that I don't assume the, the dimension because this is something that's hard to control. And this is, okay, this is useful in some quantum info applications when you have a characterization of something that does not refer to the dimension. Um, yes, yeah, so this is, the, this is the definition. And okay, I will just quickly show you the characterization. So whenever I have two measurements that are MUMs, then actually I can show in the finite dimensional case, I can show that my Hilbert space must be, dimension must be a multiple of D, which is now just the outcome number. And uh, basically, okay, the first measurement, I can just pick it to be like some computational basis on this D dimensional space and identity on the rest. And the other measurement is characterized by this D squared unitary matrices that I can arrange in like a block matrix. And if I want these two measurements to be mutually unbiased, then this big block matrix should be what we call a Hadamard matrix of unitaries. So a Hadamard matrix is a, ma a complex matrix that satisfies these relations. Now, I think of as a, as a block matrix where every block is a, is a D by, you know, it's an R by R unitary and uh, still satisfy the same kind of conditions. This is what we call the Hadamard matrix of unitaries. Mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of the most compact algebraic description of, of these measurements. And this actually also allows us to, to construct measurements that are MUMs. So this is, I'm showing this to you because it's kind of useful for the, maybe for you to believe that we could construct the examples that we have. And also if you take the outcome number to be equal to the dimension, then you recover the the MUB definition where MU, it is kind of MUBs can be described by just complex Hadamard matrices, which is also kind of recovered here. You just get this Hadamard matrix of unitaries where each block is just one by one, so it's a phase, which is exactly the definition of a, of a normal Hadamard matrix. So it's again just kind of stressing that if the outcome number matches the number of, of the, the dimension then MUMs and MUBs are the same thing. And this is kind of reflected in this characterization. And I just give you an example. You can, you can create this MUM in dimension with outcome number six. So this is a six by six block matrix of, 
of uh, two by two. Every block is two by two, and these are the power matrices. So if you kind of plug these back in the formula, you will see that uh, this defines an MUM. And these kind of constructions actually allow us to, to borrow some results from uh, uh, you can map these kind of matrices to quaternionic Hadamard matrices, and people look at that. So these kind of things allow us to construct many, many examples of these of these MUMs. Right. So we define MUMs in this kind of intuitive complementary way. How do they relate to MUBs? How different are they? How more are they more general, or, or, or what can we say about this? So, repeat what is MUM. So this is mutually unbiased measurement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a yes. This is the, the definition what, mm -hmm. that we introduced. So yes, as I said earlier, if the dimension matches the outcome number, they are exactly the same concept. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you think of something more a, a bit more operational, if you think of entropic uncertainty relations, so this is something you can define for a pair of measurements, for one measurement p. And a quantum state rho, you can define this uh, uh, quantity h of rho p, which is just the uh, the Shannon entropy of the distribution of the outcome probabilities. So I pick a state, I pick a measurement, I I see what is the probability of the, all the different outcomes. This is the probability distribution. I can take the Shannon entropy of this. Now, if I have two measurements, I can ask, okay, on the same state rho, what is there a bound on the sum of the entropies for one of the measurements and the other measurements. And uh, if I take two MUBs, then the sum of these entropies for any state is lower bounded by the same constant log of D. Mm -hmm. So this for MUBs, this is a, this was known for a long time. These are this kind of from this uh, master and looping relations for those of you who know about it. And for MUMs, we can use some more general relations that give us the, the exact same number. So in this sense, like if you if you care about the uncertainty in your measurement in in this sense, then MUVs and MUMs basically give you the same the same sort of bound. Mm -hmm. Now another thing that's that's closely related to all this uh, complementarity and uncertainty business is incompatibility. So I I say that two measurements are compatible if they are jointly measurable. Like in I don't need two copies of my state to get an outcome. For the, for the measurement A and get an outcome for the measurement B, I can just perform one measurement that gives me simultaneously the, the outcomes of A and B. Uh, so in, in quantum theory, not all measurements are compatible. You can again think of the position and momentum as the kind of canonical example, but even in, in finite dimensions, you have mm -hmm. these. And then having a concept of incompatibility, you can, de uh, you can define a measure for this, which is we use the incompatibility robustness which loosely speaking is the question, if I start with two measurements that are, let's say, incompatible, and I start adding some noise to this measurement, which means basically I take some, you can think of it as white noise, you can also think of it as some, some more complicated noise, taking some convex, some probability, probability mixture of the measurements with some other measurements that is kind of describing the noise. So the incompatibility robustness tells you the amount of noise you need to add to a pair of measurements until they become compatible. Like eventually, this is kind of you can you can probably believe this that if I if I only measure noise, which is just random outputs, then this is this gives me compatible measurements. So this kind of a this is a quantifier of how incompatible my measurements are, and you can compute this and you get the same. The same value for MUBs in dimension B and MUMs with B outputs. So again, in this sense, in this incompatibility sense, MUBs and MUMs behave behave sort of exactly the same way. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes. So 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 much about similarities. What about the differences? So the first thing you can think of that are MUMs, but not exactly MUBs is if I take a direct sum of MUB. So we saw that the, the Hilbert space for an MUM should be like a multiple of, of uh, the dimension is a multiple of D. So on each of these Hilbert spaces, I can put an MUB. And this is, well, if you think about it for a bit, you will see that this will also define an, MU, an MUM. This, it's not exactly MUB, but I just take copies of MUB. So this, this is not like a really different thing. 
And we could characterize when you have such a direct sum of MUVs. So if, remember that these MUMs were described by these unitaries. If all of them commute, uh, you have a direct sum of MUVs. So this is like, you can characterize it in this way. But then if you, well, if you look at this example, you already see that not all of them commute. So this describes an MUM, which is not a direct sum of MUVs. So it's really something like genuinely more, more, more general. I can't, it's not, it's not like I just take some copies of MUVs. I can really find MUMs that are somehow genuinely MUMs and not MUVs. Uh, yes, and the, the construction, so we construct ex explicit examples and uh, one of them is the one I showed you and we construct these through this uh, quaternion in Padawan matrices. And even more generally, uh, okay, there are these completely positive unipole maps, which you can kind of think of as maybe the most general mapping that takes a measurement and gives you another measurement. So you can say, okay, maybe not all MUMs are direct sums of MUVs, but maybe I can take one of these maps and map every MUM to an MUV. And then I'm still happy and I say, well, they are not the same thing, but kind of the same. But actually we show that this, even this is not the case. Mm -hmm. So they are really, sort of different in this sense. And uh, another thing is that what I mentioned to you is that there are at most d plus one MUVs in a given dimension d, but if I only fix the outcome number to be d, I can find arbitrarily many MUMs. So, um, so in this sense, you don't see immediately how it could be related, uh, MUMs could be related to the MUV problem, which is like about the number of MUVs. But we still tried. <laughs> and the way we tried it is through Bell non locality, which is, uh, and if you heard about it in the news <laughs> through the Nobel Prize, but I will give you just a sh very short introduction to Bell non locality and how MUMs will come into play. And then I will try to relate this to the, the MUV problem. So Bell non locality is, a, is kind of a physical scenario with two parties, Alice and Bob, who are. They, they are in some distant labs. They might share a, a quantum state. So they might share like a bipartite quantum state or some other, like some bipartite physical system. And they are allowed to perform measurements on, on their part of the state. So they perform some measurement, which is labeled by X for Alice and Y for both. And they see outcomes, which is labeled by A for Alice and B for both. And the only thing that we so we don't really know what the state is, what the measurements are. We just care about the, the outcome probabilities. So this, what is the probability that Alice sees A, Bob sees B, given that the measurements were X and Y. And in the quantum case, this is again, just described by this, the same way as before. The only thing is that because it's a bipartite state, you have a tensor product of two Hilbert spaces. So this row, the quantum state now lives on a tensor product of two Hilbert spaces. And uh, the measurements are defined by, again, these POVMs. So for setting X and outcome A, I have the operator A, X of A. So the quantum set of correlations is all the all these probability distributions that I can write in this form. And this, uh, okay, this gives you actually a convex set. And it's important, again, that we don't know anything about the, the, the state and the measurements, apart from the fact that they are there. So in, uh, in particular, there is no restriction on the dimension. They could be arbitrarily large dimensional, maybe even infinite dimensional. So this is the quantum set of correlations. And the original, the original interest in Bellman locality came from the fact that if you consider the local set, which is something that's, that's kind of like a classical description of, uh, of these distributions that you can observe. So this is a, a convex combination. So there is some lambda and this P lambda is a, a probability distribution. So this is a convex combination of these product distributions. So if I know lambda, I know that the probability of Alice obtaining A and Bob obtaining B is just the product of like, given lambda, what happens in Alice's lab is independent of what happens in Bob's lab. But then I can take some convex combination of these to introduce some, some correlations. Now, this also gives me a, a convex set. This is actually a polytope. And the interesting thing is that this is actually a strict subset of the quantum set. So you can observe some correlation quantumly that you don't have this sort of classical description for. And this is why 
that homeopathy pass theorem is kind of a, of fundamental interest. For us, it will be slightly different. Uh, so the way to witness this band on locality, band on locality is just really this fact that you can have points, these distributions quantumly that you cannot have classically. So the way that you that you see this, one way is through some linear functional. So I, I define some functional, I take some linear combination of all these probabilities that I observe, and then I try to take the maximum of this of this functional. I can define a quantum maximum, which is maximizing over distributions that are quantum, and I can take a a local or classical maximum, which is maximizing over classical distributions. And a bell inequality is an inequality of the form of saying that, well, uh, all values of this functional. So if I plug in a classical, this, the classical correlation, then I clearly have this inequality, right? It's smaller than the maximum I can get classically. And this red thing is a, mm -hmm. is a bell inequality. And it's interesting if this classical maximum is strictly smaller than the quantum maximum. Um, because then with quantum state and measurement, I can violate this inequality and show that what I see in my lab doesn't have this kind of classical description. So this is one use of bell inequalities, showing that something is a sort of non-classical. Um, another use is certifying mm -hmm. what is the state and what are the measurements that I'm using in a quantum experiment. So now uh, I don't really care about the, so my main aim is not to like, not to be classical, but you, you remember that initially I didn't know anything about the state and the measurements, but in some cases, when you reach the quantum maximum of some uh, bell functional, okay, we, in this paper, we provide a functional, this is the maximum value, in some cases, when you see this maximum value, you can actually infer some properties of the state and the measurements without having any initial information on it, right? You only see the, the outcome probabilities, and from this, you can say many things about the state and the measurement. In principle, we give a, we give a bell functional whose maximum violation certifies these relations for, for these for Bob's measurements. And if, if you remember, these are exactly the the MUM conditions. So then in this Bell experiment, you can certify that your measurements are, are mutually unbiased measurements but based only on these observed <coughs> probabilities. Um, okay, for those of you who are interested in self-testing, this point is an extreme point, but it's not a self-test. Um, what can you use this for? Apart from this, this is already kind of interesting that you can certify your states and, and or measurements. Um, what you can also use this for is, is cryptography in print, in particular device independent quantum key distribution. So it's device independent because I, a priori, I don't assume anything about the state and the measurements. I'm only looking at probabilities. Um, and it's again, this kind of uh, uh, Alice and Bob want to share some like bit string that nobody else has access to. This is kind of the task. And also this maximum violation, this certifies the state that I have. Essentially, it tells you that you must have a, a, a deep dimensional maximally entangled state, which is very useful in these bell, uh, scenarios. And, uh, well, okay, I, I'm probably not going to tell you too much about the details here, but I can add an extra setting on this side, which is maximally, which is completely correlated to one of the settings here. And the outcomes of these measurements, they give you um, your secret key. They are always the same but they are always completely random. And you can certify this just from the, uh, just from the existing correlations. And okay, this, we only use like kind of fairly well-known results to establish this fact, but we use our bell inequality and the maximum violation to get this device independent key using these two, these two results, which is also the maximal amount of key you can get from any D outcome measurement. So you can use this for cryptography and then what we also try to use this for is to tackle the existence problem of MUBs. So the, the original inequality, which well, the kind of picture is still here for it, it's for two measurements. So, okay, you can certify that you have two, a pair of MUMs. Now, if you want to modify this, this scenario for more than two measurements, we basically add more measurements for both. And for each pair of measurements, we give D squared 
measurements on for the other side, and we just sort of add up all these inequalities. And this results in a new inequality, which is uh, which you can show that if you also now restrict your dimension to to d, which is the same as this outcome number, then you can get the maximal violation if and only if the measurements here are MUBs. So this is now because I picked the dimension, they are MUBs, not MUMs. So then basically finding n MUVs in dimension D is the same as trying to optimize this functional in a fixed dimension. And this is in general quite hard, but this is what we were trying to do in this paper using some, some heuristic optimization techniques. So we, we tried three different things, some kind of Monte Carlo methods and two different like semi-definite programming variations. Here I just show you the kind of table for different uh, dimension and number of measurements. And the numbers here are the, the, the difference between the normalized difference between the maximum and uh, the, the maximum that the optimization could find. So whenever you see zero, it means that we do reach the kind of MUB value. And this is like in the first five, but four columns, these are known results, right? We know that in dimension two, there are two MUBs, there are three MUBs, but there are no four MUBs. So this kind of uh, recovers the known results and also in dimensions three, four, and five. For dimension six, we do not find four MUVs, which is which is what more or less everyone expects. But again, this is not a proof because these are these numerical techniques, they are never like, guaranteed to converge to the actual optimum. But this is sort of new numerical evidence that you do not have four MUVs in dimension six. So these are lower bounding the, the bell function are using some heuristics. Another thing you could try is upper bounding the bell inequalities. So what we tried for this uh, so far is to, to implement this so-called Moroder hierarchy. This is a hierarchy of, of algorithms with ten definite programs. The important thing is that they give you an upper bound on a given bell inequality violation with a restricted entanglement negativity, which in, a, in essence, restricts your dimension. So basically we're giving an upper bound on a better inequality in a fixed dimension. But again, this is computationally, so this is computationally very hard. So we, the only thing we managed to do with this so far is to four MUVs in dimension two, which is known, but at least it's good that the method works. For larger cases, we would need either very big computers or something, some to do something smart. And uh, if you think about analytical approaches for this, then you can look at something called the, the dual of the SDP and try to give analytical solutions for that. Okay, this is, again, for those of you who know, this is kind of related to some of the decompositions. And uh, that was my last slide. I will not talk to you through the summary because I'm already over time. So I just put it here and thank you for your attention. Thank you for the talk. And now we have time for questions. Start. I will also look. So, uh, Professor like Hartwig first. Can you share some light? Is it related to the Hebrew 70 problem? <laughs> so, I don't know much about that, but I would guess yes. The thing is, so you, you have you have a positive poly, uh, non-negative polynomial, and not all of them can be represented as uh, sum of squares or other polynomials. Mm, yes, I think okay. Hopefully, it's not related to that because that would give us some problems. Mm. <laughs> it's related in the sense that if you so this Borodar hierarchy, it's a modification of the NPA hierarchy. If you know about that. So you're trying to optimize a polynomial, basically, but now your variable is uh, no a Yes. So you're trying to optimize a polynomial, which is your your value inequality, um, but your variables do not commute. So this is kind of different from the uh, because in this Hilbert's problem, you basically you care about positive polynomials over some variables, but these are like real numbers or complex numbers. So everything your variables commute, right? This is kind of a non-commuting version of this. So for this, the usual polynomial optimization problems, you have this uh, semi-definite programming hierarchy, if you know about it, and this Lasser hierarchy. If you look at the dual SDP, it's exactly 
So basically, the semi-definite programs they try to find the sum of squares for your polynomial for a given degree, and then as you increase the degree, you kind of enter the higher levels of the hierarchy. And whenever there exists a, a sum of squares for your polynomial, well, then at some level you should find it, and uh, and you can you can maximize your polynomial. So in this sense, it's related. Mm -hmm. But because this is a modification of this NPA hierarchy, it's like a, it's kind of a sum of squares with, with a twist. <laughs> Okay, some other questions? Ah, yes. mm -hmm. So you said this, uh, and these and MUMs are equivalent in terms of robustness of robustness yes. measure for incompatibility. But is in the case of MUDs, we have like literally equivalent sets of MUDs which we have different measures of robustness. So for pairs, they are the same. For pairs? Okay. If you take a pair of MUDs, and uh, you well, it depends which robustness, but like all of the ones that we computed. So you can you can take the incompatibility the robustness, and then you have kind of various versions of this depending on what you consider as noise. Um, but for all of the ones I know about, for a pair of MUBs, they it will not matter which pair you should. So even still for pairs, you have unitarily inequivalent ones. Yes. But it will not matter for the incompatibility robustness. Uh, if you go to higher number of MUBs, okay. three, four, five, this, this can happen. Yeah, then the inequivalent. Yes, and inequivalent ones will give you different robustnesses. Yeah, but this, yeah, so this statement was about pairs. Thank you. I think we should. Okay, so last quick cool question. So you mentioned that you defined the dimension where uh, there is e plus one as usual uh, by equation. Is that contracting? Yes. Okay. Yes, you take the eigenbasis of z, x, and x times z to the power, all mm -hmm. of the powers you can fill in. Okay, okay. Okay. So let's find the speaker again.